with you again. We were here a few years back, and um, the Lord's done a lot in our life over the last few years, and it's great to see He's doing a lot here at New Heights Baptist Church. This is a special church uh, for my family and I. Uh, as the pastor said, we, we've, um, we've supported Brother Dominguez uh, when he went to Bolivia with his family, his wife, and, and then when he came to Aurora to get a church started, we were excited about getting behind him. And letting God do a work here in Aurora through him. And wow, what a, what a great work it's been. And uh, we are excited about what God is doing here at this church and the people that he's brought here. Um, uh, your assistant and his wife are, are precious to us as well, particularly his wife and, and her sister uh, as they and their father and their family were in North Dakota for years and really helped that church tremendously. And to see... Uh, his kids continue to, to uh, serve the Lord. It's a real blessing to us. And so let's go ahead and take our Bibles this morning, turn to John chapter number 4. Um, I've been pondering this passage of Scripture for well over a month, and um, I believe this is exactly what the Lord would have me to preach. I've never preached it before. Uh, he gave this to me to give to you today, and I, I pray that uh, it would reach the needs of, of everyone represented It's also a blessing to be here with some other great missionaries, Uh, the Millars. We've gotten a chance to know them over uh, the course of this last year, and happy to be with him uh, and his wife this week, as well as Brother uh, Keo, getting to know him, and and, uh, I'm already impressed by his two boys. I just just like those two guys there. I'd like to take them with me. I know that's not going to happen, but boy, I'll tell you what, uh, we're in the back row there, and you're welcome to join our family. Uh, not that we don't have enough already, but I just, I just like those two guys there, and uh, they're a real blessing. And then the Youngs, uh, last uh, uh, December, the first part of December, the end of De- November, yeah, first part of December, uh, they just said, hey, why don't you come and stay with us for a whole week? And so they gave me uh, their daughter's back room and uh, just allowed me to, to do whatever I needed to do. And I spent a whole week with him, and we went to his shop there in town and did some uh, window tending, and he did the work. I just sat there and watched. And we had some great fellowship, and his wife took such great care for me, washed all my clothes and cooked me meals, and they made me a wonderful curry, and just oh, we had a wonderful fellowship. It's so good to see the youngs and excited about what the Lord's going to do for them, or with them over there in Australia. In John chapter number 4, one of the great unique things about this passage of Scripture is that Christ is very much forthcoming with who He is. Oftentimes you read about Him conversing with others, and it's not so obvious. He doesn't necessarily put it all out there. But in this particular case, He sees an individual that desires to know, desires to hear, and He just puts it out there as far as who He is. We see the heart of Christ concerning individuals. And this morning, there's a particular verse here that we're going to focus in on. But I'd like to call your attention here in verse number 5. And we'll read a few verses. We'll pray and I'll make a few comments and then we will close. In verse number 4, it says, Then cometh he, this is Christ, to a city of Samaria, which is called Sakar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria, that sixth hour, it's around noon, and this is a a strange time for a woman to be coming, but you'll understand why as we progress in the passage of Scripture. Verse 7, There cometh a woman of of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And I want you to pay particularly close attention here in verse number 10. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, 
thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. I just want to preach. I don't always title my messages, and this may not even be as the message develops the title of the message, but the thought of, if you only knew, if you only knew, and let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, we are once again just thrilled to be able to come, first of all, together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that unites us all here this morning. And Father, we look to worship you through the singing. We look to worship you through the opening of your word and glorifying your name for what you've done. And we pray that this word, the this, this scripture this morning as it goes forth, would, would Father reach down in the hearts of these folks and meet the need that you uh, want to, to, to meet there this morning. And we ask the Holy Spirit of God, Father, might you feel welcome, might uh, you be able to do a, a work here that only you can do. Father, we, we are not looking for the words of men. Uh, we want to hear from you. This is your word. Missions and reaching people and glorifying your name. This is all part of your plan. This is not our plan. And God, so we yield to you this morning. Might you, uh, Father, do what you desire. And I pray you take the, t- the cares and the distractions and and just set them aside for a moment. Help us to focus on your word for just a few moments. Thank you for those nursery workers back there. I pray you bless them and their time. And we pray for anybody here this morning that's without Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, you know their condition. They know their condition. I pray that, Father, that they are, if there's a front up there, if there's just uh, bitterness or if there's some pride there, that, Father, you eliminate them. Help them, to Father, to see their need for Jesus Christ and be born again today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He addresses this woman. She gets off a course a little bit and she's trying to draw attention to the fact that he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan. But he focuses the message once again right upon her need. He says, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is, that saith to thee, give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. What a statement. This man, the God-man, knew this woman. I believe that he, uh, he, he, he thought about the course along the day and where it would take him. He purposed in his heart to meet this woman. He knew she was going to be there. And he addresses the subject of everlasting life. Knowing her condition. Well, what was her condition? We've got to back up just a little bit. I'm going to give you just four points this morning, four thoughts. First of all, the woman. Secondly, the ignorance. Thirdly, the gifts. And fourthly, I want to look at the subject of um, eternal life and the man, Jesus Christ. So first of all, let's take a look here at verse number five. The Bible says, then cometh he to a city of Samaria. Now, we know this woman is a Samaritan woman. So what's so unique about a Samaritan? Why was it that they didn't have any dealings with the Jews? What do we know about Samaria? Well, if we were to look at some history here, just for a moment, back in 885 B.C., uh, this particular parcel of ground was bought by the king of Israel, Omri. Now, at that time, Judah and Israel were divided. They had separate kings. And this particular king bought this portion of of ground, and you can read about that in 1 Kings chapter number 16, verses 24 through 29. And this area was, was known for its idolatry. This area was a very pagan area, and yet it was still bought by this particular king. Now, he had a son. That son's name was Ahab. And you remember his wife, Jezebel. And I'll tell you what, they were not a good king-queen match there. They, they, they had issues, and uh, they were very pagan. And remember, all the prophets of Baal were slain under the authority of this particular king during their jurisdiction. And so that gives you a little bit of the spiritual climate of this area. So this land was bought by the king. It was a, 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 it was a, a hilly area, and, and, and it was predominantly known for its idolatry. Well, about 722 
B.C., the king of Assyria conquered it, and he took out all the elite Israelis, and he brought them back with him, and he left a few Israelites there, but pretty much he brought all these other people to inhabit the cities here in Samaria. He brought brought people from Babylon, from Ava, from Hamath, and others. All these people that he brought in to inhabit this city were idolaters themselves. So now he's taken all these pagans, he's put them in a place where there's a few Jews, and what happens is it's a a big melting pot now. Now you have intermarried people with Jews and the Babylonians, and you have also a, a, a mixture, a melting pot of all the different faiths. And so you've got a mess. You've got a real mess. But what this mess eventually did was this, um, in about... 534 B.C., Cyrus ordered those exiled Jews to go back to Samaria and or back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and its walls. Well, what happened is some of those mixed races that, that believed in the Torah, uh, but also were uh, worshiping other idols, they wanted to come and help build the walls and build the temple, and they were, they were rejected. Oh, they didn't take it too well. And so they got in a little bit of a, of a a skirmish there, and they tried to make it really difficult for the Jews to rebuild and all that. And finally, they just washed their hands of it, and they went and built their own temple. And they built it in a mountain in Samaria. So now this is going to be their temple. This is where they're going to worship, along with all their other pagan gods. And so it was a real mess. This is the situation of this woman. This is the situation. She had three strikes against her. Number one, she was a woman. Say, well, why would that be an issue? Back then, during the Bible times, men did not talk to women. Particularly rabbis didn't talk to women. And here is Christ confronting a woman. This is a very strange situation here. Not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a woman, and Christ is approaching her. Say, hey, give me some water. Secondly, she was a Samaritan. Now we understand why that was strange. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans. They were half-breeds. They believed all kinds of different things. They wanted all the, the benefits of, of the Jewish religion, but they were not wholeheartedly after following after God. They were all messed in their theology. They still thought that they were a Christian just like some people today. You know, think they were Christians. They thought they were Jewish and, and all that sort of thing. And so there was a real strange relationship there, but oftentimes we find those individuals that were down and outers. Those are the ones that Jesus Christ targeted. Those are the ones that he lifted up and say, hey, look to this as an example. For instance, you have the story of the good Samaritan. And he was the one that showed kindness. It wasn't a Jewish man. It was a Samaritan. And so you have uh, the fact that she was a woman. Secondly, she was a Samaritan. Thirdly, she was running around with other men. Not a very good situation. She had at least Five husbands, the one she was with, it wasn't her husband. We read about that a little bit later on here in John chapter 4. So she was not necessarily the kind of woman that a rabbi or a teacher or any Jew is going to go and approach it. Jesus Christ approaches her, and he talks with her, and he speaks with her. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Bible says that he is no respecter of persons. And I'm so glad that Jesus Christ can look past our faults and he can look past our sin and find someone there worth redeeming. He loves your soul this morning. I'm thankful that he loved mine. Yesterday we were at the mall getting a coffee. The very back, that's where the Starbucks are at. In the very back on the left-hand side, the particular mall, and I was going there. And I was the minority. There was Hispanics, and there was Arabs, and there was some blacks, and here I was, a white guy. I'm kind of white. I'm a mix as well. And I realized that what you have is a great melting pot of people right here in your own town. You've got Ethiopians. I'm almost certain of it. And you've got people, I'm sure, from Australia, maybe Ukraine. I don't know about Hawaiians. (laughs) Sure. But man, what a great melting pot of people. I'm sitting there getting my coffee, and the gal just screwed up my order twice. Finally, she got it all, and I'm watching. I'm just observing all these different types of people come in, and there's a couple guys, you know, checking out a couple girls, and they're going over there and looking at them, and the girls are, are dressed to, you know, attract the guys. And so they're, like, you know, flirting around, and then all of a sudden another guy comes up to these other girls, and he's talking with a real lisp, and, and they know each other. And I'm thinking, you know what? There's a soul that God values. 
Those, those womanizers, God values those men right there. Those girls that are attract, you know, trying to attract those men are not really dressed in a way that you, know, you, you would want to, uh, your young girl to dress. God, loves the, God wants to see those people saved. And that guy right there with that lisp, there's a soul right there that Jesus Christ died on the cross for. I think about the people that are all around us. The Bible says in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. In Luke chapter number 15, verse 4, it says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? I'm glad that God pursues people. Christ was pursuing this woman right here. A woman of Samaria. A harlot. And down and outer. She was worse than just an ordinary person that you would say, oh, maybe they would receive it. Maybe No, she was the kind of person that nobody even wanted to deal with. But yet Christ went after her. And what a blessing that is, that he is no respecter of people. The second thing I want to look at here this morning is this. And by the way, who is a good candidate? Guys like Spurgeon, the biker. Have you ever read his autobiography? <laughs> The parties that he went to, the people that died there, the murders that took place. Was he a good candidate? I just got through reading a biography about a guy, uh, Louis Zamperini. Anybody read a book about him? Okay. And here's a guy, after he gets back, I mean, he becomes a drunkard, and he is not nice to his wife, and he is a, he's just a bad man. And one day, his wife finally talks him into going to a Billy Graham crusade. And there he receives Jesus Christ as his Savior. What a blessing. What's a good candidate? Everybody that you look at out those doors right there. We value souls because Christ values souls. I can look at all those people and say, hey, why would I even want to talk to them about Christ? You know, it's just kind of, there's a conflict there, right? The spiritual warfare. But you value because Christ died for them and he loves them. The second thing here this morning I want to look at is the ignorance of people. John chapter number 4, and particularly here in verse number 10, it says, if thou knewest. Now, there's a lot of things that I don't know much about. I'd like to learn some things more about cars and mechanics. I'm just not, I can change the oil. And on certain vehicles, maybe I could change a starter. But other than that, I, there's some things I just don't really, I don't get it, you know. And, 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 and if it's got a video, then it's going to even help me better. But uh, there's, there's so many things that I just don't know much about. But this is the worst kind of ignorance right here. You can be dumb about a lot of things. You could have a lack of knowledge about a lot of things. But don't be ignorant concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Don't be ignorant concerning the free gift of eternal life. You cannot afford it. He says, if thou knewest. He knew if he would just be able to communicate that, that she would understand it and she would want it. In fact, she does. If you look at verse uh, number... Um, Oh, look at uh, verse number 15. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I might uh, thirst not, neither come thither to draw. Sometimes people just need to know. They just need to hear. This woman grew up in an environment and was taught religions that, that was pushed on her that she had no control over. I am so thankful. Listen, I, I, I was born in a Christian home. Obviously, it doesn't make us a Christian, but it sure helps us get off on the right foot. Amen? Amen? But I didn't, have that, uh, I didn't have the upbringing of some of you here this morning and some of those people out there and those at the mall that I met. I didn't have that upbringing. And some of them from a very little child were born up, raised up Roman Catholic or, or, or raised uh, as a Muslim or raised whatever it might be. This, this woman, she was not raised with the correct knowledge. She was ignorant of what Christ had to offer until Christ told her. The people around us, they have such a, a slim knowledge, a, 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 just a, a, a very little knowledge concerning the reality of what the gospel is all about. You knock on doors and you ask people, you, you figure that out right away. You know, where are you going to go when you die? Do you have any? Well, you know, maybe we hope so. What are you basing that on? I don't know. You know. It sounds good. If they're honest with you, they'll just say, either that's what I was taught or, or, or that just sounds good. And from my heart, that's what I really believe. But they don't have a final authority. They're still ignorant. So glad we got something that we can share, right? It's not man's opinion. Well, it goes on to look over here at Ephesians chapter number 4. Hold your place in John 4. We'll be back there. Ephesians chapter number 4. 
Ephesians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth not walk as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because the blindness of their hearts. Verse number 19, being, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Aren't you glad this morning someone taught you out of the Bible what it means to be saved? Taught you about the man, Christ Jesus? Many people around us are ignorant of the truth. She was ignorant. Christ saying, if you just knew. Paul, over there in Acts chapter number 17, verse 23, he, re, he remarks about an altar. He says, yeah, you made this altar to the unknown God. And just in case we missed one out there. People are ignorant in what they believe. Hey, listen, uh, uh, they put their faith in things uh, like statues and, 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 and even God's creation. And, and they don't understand what it is to have a fellowship with a living God. And, and they'll pray and they'll, they'll burn incense and they'll sacrifice bananas. And they'll do all kinds of things to, to appease God and, 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 and to, to uh, uh, show their loyalty. And yet they never, never at one time in their life have ever had a fellowship with that God in whom they're worshiping. The other day I was at a steak place, sushi place, and I was walking out, and, and, and over in the corner of this restaurant was a little Buddha. And the Buddha had a, an altar, and there was incense being there, and there was, there was some bananas and some other fruit there. And those people, no matter how much sacrifice, they're so ignorant of the truth that we can find in the Word of God. And they have no fellowship with Buddha. They never had fellowship with Buddha or anything. They, they, they don't understand the privilege of what we have here this morning as Christians to be able to wake up in the morning and to pray out to our God. He's alive and He loves us and He wants to walk with us that day. What a blessing it is. But people are without the knowledge of who Christ is. Take your Bibles and look over here with me at Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10. In verse number 1, in Romans chapter 10, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to what? Knowledge. Knowledge. There's some ignorance there. They're going to do it the best that they can. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You and I have the answers. It's, it's not us. It's not in this church or in your pastor. The knowledge is in the Word of God. And we need to point them to Jesus Christ. Back over here at John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4. We looked at the woman. We looked at the ignorance. Let's look at the gift. John chapter number 4. And he says here in verse 10, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, that thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. All you have to do is ask for it, he tells her. If you only understood what the free gift was, you would ask for it. It's just that simple. You know, if... If it's so great, don't people want it? Absolutely. And sometimes it's just a lack of knowledge. And so he is going to offer something to her that she had never heard of before, and she, re if she receives it. Now listen, if, if she, what she needed was a, a better system of pulling that water up that would help her on a day-to-day -day basis, God would have sent Jesus Christ the engineer. If she needed help putting poems together and she just really struggled, God would have sent Jesus Christ the poet. If she needed help with her violin or whatever she was playing at that time, Christ would have sent Jesus, or God would have sent Jesus Christ the musician. But he knew her greatest need. 
And it wasn't in better water or better food or better anything else. What she needed was everlasting life. And so He sent Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the gift. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. She needed this living water. Look at verse number 11. The woman said unto her, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this, that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. See, this was a supernatural gift. This was the best gift. This is the gift that keeps on giving. Amen? Verse number 14, But whosoever drinketh this water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Hey, listen, this morning, if you only knew, if you only knew what it was to be saved, some of you this morning, you are saved. You understand it. You know the change that Jesus Christ has made in your life. But maybe some of you this morning don't understand that you never have trusted Christ as your Savior. Let me just say, if, if I could just tell you, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. It, it, when Christ changed my life, when He forgave me my sins, and He set me in heaven, uh, at the right, uh, with, with, He's <laughs> seated in heavenly place with Christ Jesus. Hey, if you could understand that this morning, if you would only understand what salvation does for a man that's basically hopeless in this world. The Bible says in Revelation chapter number 22, verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. It's not only just the greatest gift, but it's a free gift. Christ paid it all, man. He did everything. All you've got to do is receive it. And once she understood that, she said unto the Lord in verse number 15, Sir, give me this water. Why wouldn't you want it? Why wouldn't you want it? That I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. I'm afraid today that so much is being offered by the way of religion goes unfulfilled in the person's life. They have to keep on going back to that well. Keep on continuing in the way that they've always done it in order to kind of feel religious or feel some relief from all their sin and their guilt. When you come to Jesus Christ, the gift is eternal life. And when He saves you, it's forever. The sins are taken away. And you have a right relationship with Him. But I'll tell you what, all that gift, it would not make any difference at all if it wasn't given by the right person. And finally, the last point I want to make is the man, Christ Jesus. In verse number 10, He says here, if thou knewest the gift of God, that was eternal life, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, that is the man, Christ Jesus, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Who was Christ? Well, she saw a man in all his humanity, a man that was weary on his way and that sat at the well and he was thirsty. That's what she saw. She saw the man, Christ. But what she needed to see was the man, the Son of God, what she needed to see was the deity of Jesus Christ. What she needed to see was God in the flesh. Yes, he was a man, but he was more than a man. Yes, he was a prophet, but yeah, he was more than a prophet. He was a teacher, but he was more than just a teacher. He was a healer, but more than a healer. He was a powerful orator, but he was more than an orator. He was God in the flesh. He was the creator that spoke the worlds into existence. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. And what he's about ready to do in the upcoming chapters was raise the dead. He was going to heal the brokenhearted. He was going to calm the storms. He was going to put to silence those that were educated. He was going to stump the religious crowds. He was going to take five loaves and two fishes and feed thousands. He was going to cause the lame to walk and the blind to see. He was going to walk on water and then He would die and conquer death for you and me. That's Jesus Christ. That's who she needed to see. He begins to unfold His deity through His love. Because just as she asks For that water, he says to her in verse number 16, 
Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. So was that a baited question? He was revealing to her that he knew about her. He was getting her to acknowledge her sin. In verse number 17, the woman said, I answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thine husband, uh, is not thy husband in that sayest thou truly. <laughs> and the woman, she said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Yeah, but more than a prophet. There are a few men that could discern some things and even can do a few miracles, Elijah and Elisha, examples of that. But this was more than a prophet. And automatically she tries to get this subject off of herself. And Christ is always pointing to the fact that she needs this gift. If you only knew, you would ask of me. But yet he addresses that need in her own life. He shows a supernatural love. In verses 25 and 26, the Bible says, And the woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah has come, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. See, she didn't quite understand fully who this was. She knew he was a great prophet and he could understand some things. She dis he discerned some things about her, but she was quite unclear as to who he was. But yet that is important. That is key. That is foundational. Who is Christ? The Muslims believe he was a great prophet, but he was more than a prophet. The Mormons believe that he was the brother of Lucifer and he was not. He was God in the flesh. And he tells her that. In verse number 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. One of the most clear portions of the scripture concerning Christ's deity. I am he. I am God in the flesh. I am the one that was foretold to come. I am here standing before you. All of a sudden the light bulb comes on. And she leaves after the disciples show up. And yet in all, knowing all of this, knowing all about her, her condition, he's still willing to deal with her still willing to give her this eternal life. See, it didn't matter that she was a woman. It didn't matter that she was a Samaritan. It didn't matter about her past. There was a love for this woman, a love for her soul, worth redeeming. He wanted her to receive this eternal life. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In John chapter number 10, verse number 17 and 18, it says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This commandment have I received of my Father. When Christ went to that cross, and he died that death. He did not die as a man necessarily. He died in all his power and fullness. No man took his life from him. I think Brother Millar was mentioning this morning, most men would have already died. I believe that. I believe that. Now I'll show you his deity revealed at the cross. Look over here at Luke chapter number 23. Just a simple little thought. There are several of them. I've got about five. I'm just going to give you one this morning that shows this was God on the cross. Luke chapter number 23. The Bible says, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my what? My spirit. Hold it there and look over Ecclesi uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter number 8. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. I'm here to tell you that no man can ever do that. No man can give his spirit away to God the Father or anything at a whim, uh, 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 being his own will and, and laying that out there. Only God can do that. 
Uh, No one of us here this morning have power over death. Uh, We might try to kill ourselves through different means, but there's no guarantee that you're going to die when you try to do that thing. And that God uh, didn't do anything to kill himself. He laid his life down and that spirit, he, he willed that spirit to be gone, ascended to the Father at his will. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number eight. Ecclesiastes chapter number eight. Look at verse eight. The Bible says this. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are in given to it. I'm here to tell you that when Jesus Christ said, into thy hands I commend my spirit, only God himself could have done that. No man can do that. No man can do that. In the midst of all of that, in the midst of dying for the sins of the world, he is thinking about you, he's thinking about me, he's thinking about the word of God, and he's thinking about all these things come to pass. All right, they, they didn't part my garment. And, and uh, 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 you know, uh, I, I, one of the things that he says is, I'm, I thirst. Why did he say I thirst? Not because he was thirsty. He said it to fulfill Scripture. And so in the midst of all of that, he's still thinking about, he's got his mind sharp and he's alert and he's, he's thinking about Scripture. He's thinking about you. He's thinking about everything that encompasses what's going on there in the cross. This was not ordinary. The other day I was with a bunch of guys where I haven't done jujitsu in probably three years. I used to teach that and be involved in that. And I had a guy at the church say, hey, why'd you come out? He says, I got this great guy. And so I go out there and uh, we get done about an hour and these guys want to roll for a little bit afterwards. And I haven't done this in three years. I'm out of shape, man. So these guys grab me and we're rolling. The first guy, no problem. The second guy, another six minutes, about one minute into it. I'm like, I just want to die. I'm feeling sick, so I'm feeling nauseous, I'm about ready just to puke, and, and yet this guy is still trying to go, and I go, oh, I got four or five more minutes, and, and, and I just felt awful. The last thing I wanted to do was try something new. I just wanted to lay down and die. In the midst of sickness, you just think about your sickness. In the midst of a broken arm, you're just thinking about the agony of the arm. In the midst of the cross, Christ was thinking, is Scripture fulfilled? That's a supernatural individual. Oh, I better say I thirst. I want to fulfill that portion of Scripture. It's unbelievable. This was the God-man. So we look at the woman. She was wicked, yeah, but Christ, He came to her. You look at the ignorance, and yet God wanted to give her knowledge concerning the gift in Himself. And then finally, we look at the gift, eternal life, and the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, look over here at John chapter number 4 as we wrap this up. John chapter number 4. We find the woman, she goes off, the disciples come in. What are you talking to this woman for? And he makes a remark. And he says in verse number 32, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Why are we here this morning? Man, there, there is a need that Jesus Christ has given to you and I, the ministry of reconciliation. This world doesn't know anything about it. Even Christians, some Christians don't even know about it. But we have meat to eat here. Therefore, they said the disciples unto one another, hath any man brought him ought to eat? Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Part of that is to reach people, ultimately to go to that cross and finish his work. Verse number 35, say not ye... There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. And he goes from one situation where he's working with a person and he uses that to teach his disciples, this is why you're here. This is what I want you to do. Well, those, those, she goes back to the village and she tells everybody about it. She said, come here, a man that told me everything ever I did. Everybody comes out and the revival breaks out. He's there for over two days, teaching and preaching. And they say unto him, they said unto the woman, verse number 42, and, and said unto the woman, now we believe... 
Not because of thy saying, but I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for her saying, if she didn't go back to the village and say, hey, come and hear a man that told me everything that I did. Hey, listen, they just wanted to distance themselves from her, but she didn't care. Something supernatural had happened, and she was going to share it with everybody that she could. And they heard it, and they came, and they believed. And some of them, after further hearing of God's word, put their faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Amen. Hey, listen, this morning, you don't have to take my word for it. Take the word of God. And believe it. It says there in verse number, oh, verse 42. It said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy sayings, for we heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. I think about Christ's earthly ministry, how short it was, and yet he found time for individuals. Here's a woman Nobody even wanted to deal with. He saw some value and given her the knowledge of the truth. This morning, as you walk out of these doors, the mission field is right there, man. It's right there. You're right in the melting pot. You've got all kinds of different... Listen, you don't even have to be a missionary. Now, I'd love to see some of you go to the field. You don't have to be a missionary. God is bringing them all to you. He's bringing them all to you. And you've got a great pastor. You've got a great church. God can do some marvelous things. We need to pray, God, give us a love and a compassion for souls, the same that you have. Help us make a difference. We've got the knowledge. We just got to go and share it.